Have you ever wondered what it was like for prostitutes in ancient Greece? What about Jesus in India? Yes, perhaps what I said is slightly blasphemous, leading with prostitution and then Jesus, but it's way more fun to introduce the episode this way. If you're fascinated by ancient religion, philosophy, and unexplainable phenomena throughout human history, stay tuned, because I'm here today with a very special guest to ponder some of life's great big burning questions, such as, why do people follow religion at all? Today's guest is particularly special for a few reasons. He has appeared on the Joe Rogan podcast multiple times over the years, as well as Duncan Trussell's Family Hour, Jocko Podcast, and collaborated with Dan Carlin for some pretty epic lessons in history. He is the host of The Drunken Taoist, as well as the History on Fire podcast, and is the author of the book Create Your Own Religion, among several others such as Not Afraid and On the Warrior's Path. He is a university professor with a seventh degree black belt in Kung Fu. You can't really get much more badass than that. He's also a fascinating character with a perspective on the world to boot. So without further ado, let me introduce you to the one, the only, Daniele Bolali. listen to Joe Rogan all the time and so the Rogan route yes. yeah <laughs> the Rogan route <laughs> and uh and he bought your book and I read it and was like oh this is great so having you on the podcast is um is wonderful because you know it's funny because you read a book and then it has like a significant impact on on your uh, outlook and perspective and then to actually get to to chat with that person is a great honor so thank you so much the wonders of technology right <laughs> definitely boom here we go <laughs> so something that you had said i was listening to um i believe it was your episode on um History on Fire, which is an excellent podcast, by the way. Um, but it was the one about Diogenes. Oh. And you had said something about um, Adelphi, the Oracle. Mm -hmm. And that kind of stood out to me because I actually have a, um, I've got an Ayurvedic book. And something that I read in there was um, about how, like, I've got it here where it talks about um, like possession by the gods and like side effects of channeling. And that kind of stood out because you had said that I guess um, oracles didn't live very long or something yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, like, I guess throughout history and your studies, how, how often do people seek out seers and oracles and mystics? A lot. Cause uh, as a general rule, we don't, know much of anything about how the universe works i mean even like you know modern science that's great it still uh, doesn't explain uh, if there's anything after you die doesn't explain if there was anything before you were born doesn't explain about meaning in the universe or anything so it's mm -hmm. so those are the things that people want answers to not having answers to those things is unsettling and disturbing to most people and it's kind of hard for many people that's hard to live so of course you want answers to some of the things that are technically unanswerable by even by modern science so inevitably that's what people would turn to for to find out and you know and traditionally if you go back to like the most ancient forms of religions ever Everybody at one point or another, whether you call it shamanism or animism or tribal religions, it's all the same thing, right? And everybody has somewhat similar beliefs to one degree or another. You know, obviously we would change from one tribe to the next, but some core ideas about the idea that there are spirits out there, mm -hmm. the idea that spirits can interact with human beings, that they can guide you, they can, if they like you, 
they can talk to you. They can be positive or negative. They can have a good influence or a bad influence. You know, all of this stuff is something that you find all over the globe. Hmm. So the notion that some people would be, quote unquote, better at being in touch with spirits and passing the messages to other people, that's pretty much a human universal, you know, you find it everywhere. Hmm. Maybe that's why I find them so interesting because the stories, they do just kind of add like a certain amount of magic to and the meaning of life which which is comforting but uh yeah I found that really interesting that you had said that they didn't live very long because Mm -hmm. that was very similar to what I had read and then like in this book like I don't know people talk about possession and all these different things and this is a first on the podcast (laughs) for sure but um yeah, it talks about different kinds of possession and by different kinds of spirits. And um, what I found really interesting was, um, and I'll grab it because it was very, very similar to what you had said, where it was saying that um, channeling has possible side effects, um, like on a physical level, I guess, both physical and mental. And you have to weaken the hold um, sorry, you have to weaken the hold of your own life force um, in order to let another being work through it. And on a psychological level, um, it says you can lose control of, you can lose control of your emotional energy and then long-term disorders. It can actually manifest like arthritis, insomnia, epilepsy, all sorts of different things. So have you encountered that before as well? Or was it just that one? Well, interesting enough, what I did read was, I did read something about oracles in another context with similar stories that it takes a huge toll on the body and all of that. Mm -hmm. However, when you look at shamanic cultures in general, not just specifically the oracle, even though they do something very similar, you don't really read the same stuff. You know, Mm -hmm. a bunch of people who are, you know, the medicine man or medicine woman or shaman or however you want to call it, Mm -hmm. they have the same life as everyone else as far as uh, lifespan. So I'm not sure why, what the gig is with uh, the culture that specifically has something a little more structured like an oracle, Mm -hmm. why that seems to take an extra toll compared to standard shamanic practices that are, you know, in nature really similar. So I'm not Mm -hmm. quite sure why the difference is there. Hmm. Interesting. I actually, I know a Navajo medicine man who lives in Arizona. I should ask him because... He's like the ghost buster. (laughs) So um, something else that I was wondering was like how, um, I guess how closely related is modern day structures to like ancient Greece? I'm sorry, modern day? Like, sorry, um, how closely related is um, ancient Greece to modern day structures and just the way that we... the way that we live? Um, I mean, clearly there's stuff that, like, if you look at the Greece and Rome to sort of at the whole Greco-Roman world, there are obviously a lot of continuities and, you know, there's a lot that is seen as sort of a cradle of Western thought and all of that stuff, right? So mm-hmm. the, there is continuity. On the other hand, it's also a completely other reality in just about every other level, from the fact that all of those societies were completely built on slavery, to the fact that, uh, you know, attitudes about pretty much anything were very different from uh, both ancient Greece and ancient Rome, for example, had no concept of homosexuality the way we do, or, you know, the idea of gender roles the way we think of them. They were a completely different thing. Mm-hmm. You can go, go down the list and, <clears throat> you know, the number of differences is quite high. So while, you know, there are points of similarity, there is the idea of uh, more active participation in political lines, some long, more democratic lines, okay? So you do find that in Greece and it spreads after. Uh, you do find, that, you know, certain core concepts are definitely there, but then there's, you know, filter that through a whole other universe of things that have nothing to do with the way we perceive the world today. 
Right. Okay. Actually, something that you had said in that same episode about Diogenes that I found interesting, there was a couple things, but you were saying that apparently um, prostitutes in ancient Greece were more educated than, um, they were like highly educated because, can you enlighten enlighten me a little bit on that? Because I know that that was something you had brought up. So there were, I think, two different levels to prostitution. There was kind of street prostitution. There was uh, poor, cheapy, and no, nothing particularly well-educated about it or particularly mm-hmm. glamorous or desirable. It was a hard, crappy life if you had no other means, and that's where it's at. On the other end, there was kind of the high end of the sex work world. There was, ve- you know, these were ladies who usually were super well educated because they weren't just there for sex get out boom done and over with Mm -hmm. they were more like like drinking companions of some of the men and conversationally you know more for sex was part of the equation but definitely wasn't the only one so they were kind of more in some way companions but not just during party like they had to kind of hold their own in conversation in philosophical discussion in this that and the other so they were more almost like uh, Greece was very weird because it had a super patriarchal structure they were like the role of women was not particular you know there weren't that much freedom for women um, oddly enough, for the very, very high-end sex workers, they were kind of brought in into this male world and be made a part of in a way that pretty much no other woman, free or otherwise, was. Hmm. So because of that, they were allowed and even required to have some degree of education that was not typical for other women of the time. Right. Yeah. So like more of on an intellectual level was where they were expected to be meeting yeah. these men. Interesting. Yeah. I thought, I found that quite interesting. Um, I mean, in some sense that stuff exists today as well, mm-hmm. right? There is the sex work you had the more desperate end of street level where it's really a rough life in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. And there's the super high end where, of course, you're still talking about sex, but there's so much more behind it that, you know, a lot of what some of these ladies get paid for is not just the sex, it's kind of this whole other experience that go around it. And and many of them will, the, you know, the power equation is completely different. Mm-hmm. Some of these ladies charge crazy money, they are able to charge crazy money, they are able to pick their clients, they are able to be very, because they are so highly thought. And... Um, and so even today, you know, people say sex work like it's one thing. It's not. It's like mm-hmm. there's so many different shades of that that they don't even resemble one another. You know, one end is super exploitative. On the other end, it really isn't. And the power equation is very much on the other side. Mm. Was it like a little bit more, um, was it like more accepted back in, in ancient Greece than it is today? Because I know yeah. there's, I mean, it depends on who you're talking to, but there's still a huge stigma around it. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of that is uh, Christian thought, you know, Mm -hmm. the anti-sex work thing, at least in the West. You know, it's very, uh, oddly enough, even in Christian thought, early on, it wasn't like that. Mm -hmm. Where even like super strict thinkers in matter of sexuality, like St. Augustine, you know, one of the kind of key pillars of the early church, was fully in favor of legal prostitution and argued that without legal prostitution, society would just go to hell because it would be these kind of sexually repressed men would go crazy and it would all be there. So it's, it's interesting to see how it evolves over time. Mm-hmm. But yeah, generally speaking, the whole super negative sti- sti- stigma on sex work is more... Um, there's another layer that's more modern than not, and that's its post-Christianity. Interesting. Yeah, actually, because I'm pretty sure that there's statistics that show in places that are um, incredibly religious and sexually repressed, there's way more crime against women and children, like tons. Definitely. There's way more crime, period, usually. Mm -hmm. In general, like a lot of the negative statistics tend to go, which kind of begs the question, is the chicken or an egg thing? Is like, Mm -hmm. are these places more 
dysfunctional to begin with and so people crave some kind of solid hardcore moral line and they go to the more fundamentalist religions mm -hmm. which clearly doesn't seem to solve the problem but at least it makes them feel better <laughs> psychologically <laughs> or is that some of these holding some of these beliefs makes some of these social problems way worse Hard right. to tell. you know it's a who knows which way the causal connection goes but there's definitely a connection Right. Well, and that's the thing, something that you were just saying um, made me think of um, uh, when you were saying in Create Your Own Religion, and it was along the lines of um, people needing a uh, dogma or some rules to follow if their internal guidance system is broken. Like, what do you think that comes down to? Is that just... Just some are prominent in areas where people are kind of brought up to just follow and accept blindly because, I mean, for me, I think that's why I liked that book so much because I've always been a bit of a rebel. And if people, you know, tell me to go one way, I want to go to the opposite. Sure. So, yeah, I'm just kind of curious about that. I think dogma is just reassuring. You know, life is complicated enough and scary enough and you have to make up your own mind at every turn of the way. And there's, you know, you can, how many times in life can we make bad decisions that take us to a bad place? A lot, all the mm -hmm. time, right? From the people you interact with to your life choices about work, career, uh, your, you know, there are 10 million things where we have to choose. And it's kind of scary sometimes to constantly have to wing it, essentially, because you are making stuff up as you go, trying to figure out what the best option is. Mm -hmm. So to have somebody who come around and tell you, I have all the answers. I already know exactly what leads to great, wonderful outcomes, and you'll be safe, and life will be wonderful, and what leads to terrible places. All you got to do is follow these ideas. And so there's a sense that psychologically, very reassuring you know it's like most dictators most uh, religious cult leaders most they all fulfill the same function of like this daddy figure who reassure you pats you on the back uh, protects you but at the mm -hmm. same time tells you what to do and all you got to do is follow what they say and there's nothing else to it that makes life so easy because you don't have to constantly struggle and think and go back and forth. All you got to do is follow the line. And, you know, they mm. give you an identity, they give you colors and a uniform and uh, who we are and who the bad guys are. And it's very, very, very psychologically reassuring. Right. Yeah, that makes sense because life is, life is hard sometimes and messy. <laughs> as, I think that's the thing that as... Um, as time goes on, I'm like, I don't really think life ever gets easier. I think you just kind of get better at navigating, navigating the obstacles or like right. figuring out, you know, how to pick yourself up again when you've hit rock bottom or whatever. <laughs> no, that's, so That's what, the, and I think so it's understandable. I mean, it's like, I, of course, I'm not exactly a big fan of dogma, but I understand the psychological push behind it. Why mm -hmm. people gravitate to it because it's weird when you think about it especially in the modern world why still when you add up the people who stick to like hardcore religious fundamentalism or the people who have been seduced by totalitarian ideologies like nazism fascism communism mm -hmm. you go down the list of all the dictators who have had tremendous success it seems weird. It's like, why would anybody want to sign up for that? You know, all the religious cults that... Charles Manson. <laughs> no sense from the outside and all of that. It's because they fulfill a psychological need that's rather big in a lot of people. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, it's, you know, I grew up in a very religious community, like it's considered the Bible Belt. And I think we must have like, by now, a couple thousand churches. And my family, I was never raised religious, but I did start questioning this idea, like, my mom would bring us to Sunday school uh, to play with my cousins, even though like my mom couldn't care less if she was really there. And I remember the Sunday school teacher sitting down and talking about Jesus and, and God. And, uh, and I just remember having this question. I must have been like five and thinking, okay, well, who created God? And then life kind of continued on for me. And those questions never really went away. And 
uh, like I remember I went to a church um, by myself. I would like take the bus and I would go there. Um, and it was like an, probably like an hour's bus ride or something like that. And then it was kind of like, I think I was around 13 or 14 because I wanted to know something. But then as soon as they started telling me what I, you know, when I had to show up and like making things mandatory, what I could wear, um, that was kind of when I was like, "Mm, no, thanks. I'm not going to (laughs) be, you know? And then a few years later, I kind of, um, I had a friend introduce me to the Hare Krishna sort of movement and to the temples there. And um, I really do love um, Eastern philosophy and and things about Hinduism and like the Vedic philosophy. But um, as I started to like realize um, more about the things happening within that movement and all of the rules, I like that was another thing. I was like, okay, well, here here is something else. And like I kind of went out searching, you know, okay, what could I follow? What makes sense? I have to have something to believe in. And then right. I read your book and was like, oh, wait a second, I can believe whatever I want. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, um, that was something that I also wanted to talk to you about was um you were talking about Alexander and when he went over to India and how he seemed to have this infinity towards um, the intellectuals and like the, the mystics. Can you share a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, both in the um, Diogenes example back in Greece and then when he mixed it with India with some of the sadhus there were like these kind of mystics who live on. It's very odd because you have this description of these encounters between the guy who's pretty much the most powerful man on earth at that point, or if not fully on earth, because there may have been a couple of other places, but still, you know, he's one of the absolute most powerful rulers in the world. And at the same time, he clearly is attracted to the philosophy of these guys who are living essentially with nothing. They have, they own nothing. They don't carry any political power. They, they are basically homeless, voluntarily so but they are these uh, hermits in the forest. And and so there's something there that, you know, in the Alexander case makes you think that maybe he was trapped in his own game, that maybe he couldn't get out. Mm -hmm. uh, He clearly seemed to be fascinated with something that's the exact opposite of his life. You know, his life is all about sort of ruling the empire and having all these people under you and material wealth and commanding and this and politics and all of that stuff. And instead, he keeps being like, huh, what do these guys... And these guys at one point flat out tell him. They are like, look, what you are looking for, you're never going to get it. Just uh, quit now already. You know, you're just making trouble for everybody, invading, doing this and that and the other. They are hinting at the fact that he's searching for something that he's not going to find through his military conquest. Mm-hmm. And Alexander, both with Diogenes and with these guys, he seemed to thank them and respect them and kind of hear what they are saying and at the same time not be able to get off the horse of what he's doing. And he's sort of too invested into it to, to step away. Right. <clears throat> And I actually, I think that that makes sense for a lot of people, you know, I think that there's so much of life where we kind of, we might have these, I call them like zig and zag where you, you want to know more and you have that curiosity, but you know, you kind of just get trapped in, um, your day to day, you get trapped in sort of like your idea and your story and, you know, (sighs) Actually, you know, in Hindu or Vedic philosophy, when they talk about Maya and illusion and all of that kind of stuff, you know, and, and I think that a lot of people are curious and want to know more, but it's, I I don't think that we have a lot of places that we can explore that anymore. That's kind of something missing. Yeah. And I think in that sense is people like that idea of free exploration, that idea of create your own, of taking from different sources to really see what makes sense to you. Mm-hmm. On one end, it seems obvious. It seems like, well, of course, why would you want to do anything else? But the key things that the reason why people usually choose not to do that, besides laziness, besides a little bit of fear, 
is also that more the more traditional beliefs give you a sense of identity. And mm-hmm. identity is something that people heal and be killed for. You know, the same way as a nation gives them a sense of identity based on you are a filling the blanks, wherever you're from, right? Right, right. Uh, the same way that religions do it, the same way that politics, people gravitate to identity like crazy. It's like being a part of the yacht club. <laughs> totally. And in that sense, to me, it's like the old ladies at church and the motorcycle gang are looking for the same stuff in many cases. Mm-hmm. There's that sense of belonging, that sense of identity, that sense of this is how we do things. Um, it's something that most human beings crave. And so that's why, again, dictators or cult leaders are so easy, so skilled at manipulating this, because it's such a strong human need that if you can deliver it to people, <clears throat> they may follow you in the weirdest possible directions as long as you are delivering that, because it's something they crave so bad. Right. Yeah. Lots of false promises in the name of religion, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Um, I I think also it's like this need for human connection. You know, we need to feel like, you know, connected to something. And for maybe, um, I think also for some people that maybe um, didn't have that sense of family and connection growing up, they can go out seeking that in other places. And the thing with that is it does, in a sense, if you don't have a pretty clear sense of autonomy over your mind and your thoughts and can really discern between um, what's being said to you and how it lands. Because something I was talking about with a friend uh, just recently was someone can be giving you a message, but the intention, like the message might be good, but the intention behind the message could be something different. So it's important to be able to take something in, but then question it and question how it makes you feel and where is it coming from before you accept it. And if you don't have that sense of, um, I don't know, whatever you want to call that discernment, maturity, wisdom, if you don't have, if you don't have that, you can absolutely end up being one of these people who gets really taken advantage of because we all have this need for some meaning in our life. And I'm a huge believer in finding that for yourself. So, but yeah, that's uh, in order to find it for yourself, it requires you to have a fairly high degree of uh, self confidence. Mm. Because otherwise, along the way, there are going to be 32,000 people who want to sell you a prepackaged set of beliefs, identity, uh, with the promise of kind of safety and this is what you have been looking for the whole time and this will end all this trouble and travail that you go through all Mm -hmm. the time and thinking so hard about stuff. So, I mean, if you want to be, like if you're a smart and not particularly nice person, manipulating people is really easy. (laughs) (laughs) There's a whole, you know, so many people have these buttons that are so obvious just on them, on their personality. And as long as you know how to press the button the right way, you can make them go one way, another, another. Mm-hmm. It's, of course, that's a horrible way to be. It's like, it's not, uh, yeah. in fact, if you are actually smart, but not a horrible person, mm-hmm. then you learn how to com- use it rather than manipulation as a form of communication to deliver messages in a way that are a little easier for this person to hear than not. Yeah, I, I see that on Instagram all the time. And it's like, you know, buy this uh, my package, my program, and your life will look just like mine. And I'm like, no, it's not how it works. Like everyone has their own formula. And if I were to go out and say, like, follow, we'll just use Gary V as an example. I don't really follow his stuff, but my partner does. <laughs> if I were to follow Gary V's advice, like that for me, I wouldn't have the same kind of success because I'm a different person. I have different drives. I have Money is not a motivator for me. Um, And yeah, but you see that just everyone's trying to sell people on this idea. And I'm thinking, you know, well, what is it that people need? People just need some encouragement and a little bit of um, 
you know, just confidence in their own path and finding their own way. But there is definitely plenty of people out there. I see it all the time who are more than willing to take your money and sell you the magic pill, which does not exist. <laughs> convince themselves, you know, maybe they are not completely cynical. Maybe they're also a little self-delusional. It's because it worked for them, mm-hmm. then they assume clearly this will work for everybody. Mm-hmm. And, like, uh, and maybe it works for not just them. Maybe it works for a bunch of other people. Mm-hmm. But again, it's not going to work for everybody. That's why to me, it's like, I tend to trust better people who tread really lightly, who are mm-hmm. more sharing what works or what doesn't for them, sharing their experience without assuming that their experience is going to be your experience or that mm-hmm. if you just follow the 12 steps that I just gave you, everything is like, no, it doesn't work that way. No, you have to try yeah. this, see if it works, try that, see if it works. And it's nice to hear the process. You know, I love mm-hmm. to hear people who are happy with what they have done or successful in what they've done. I love to hear their process, right? But that does not mean that it's going to be mine or that it can work for mm-hmm. someone else. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Or maybe you borrow just some elements from it that is like, you know what? That one insight works really well. Everything else you wrap it in doesn't work for me. But mm-hmm. that one thing does. So I'm going to take that aspect and use that part. <laughs> Yeah. See, and you were saying about people being like enthusiastic and excited and wanting to share. That was actually a humbling moment that I had. I was one of my best friends. I asked her, I was like, um, you know, am I, am I arrogant? Like, do I have like, cause somebody had said I was arrogant and I was like, somebody close to me and I was like, am I arrogant? Like, where do I come across this way? So first thing I did, I asked my mom and she's like, well, no, I just think sometimes like you, it's just the way you talk. You really want to share stuff and you can, I know you're not arrogant. You don't think you're better than people. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to ask somebody else I trust. So I asked my best friend and she's like, well, no, I don't think you're arrogant. I've never got that. But sometimes when you're really excited about something and you really want to share it, you can kind of get caught up in it being like the answer. And I was like, oh, yeah. That's interesting. And so I kind of had this moment where I was like, okay, I need to make sure that when I am excited and sharing um, what works for me, that I give other people that same sort of space to figure out what works for them so that it's, of course. you know. <laughs> it's understandable because you are enthusiastic when you found out something that works and you can't wait to share it. And mm-hmm. somebody else is like, hey, this can actually help you out. And maybe it will. And maybe we really will, but there's no guarantee. And so that's why it's great to frame it as an experience. As like, Mm -hmm. can you believe this is really working well for me? Mm -hmm. You want to give it a shot? This is how I've done it. Mm -hmm. And then with the understanding that no two people are alike, some things are clearly better than others, alternative wise. But it's kind of like if you have kids, you know, like some people will have their parenting philosophy thinking that that will apply to every single kid. Mm -hmm. And granted, again, some are obviously better than others, right? If your parenting philosophy involves them whacking them in the head every time they drop a fork, it's probably not the best approach ever. Few people come out well from it. Mm -hmm. But as a general rule, still no two kids are alike. So while some things will work with more kids than others, uh, some kids need a lot of structure. They Mm -hmm. need... And they thrive on being given very clear guidelines of what's okay. They want rules a little more. Mm -hmm. Other kids really don't. And the more you trust them and the more you work with them on saying, giving them space, you know, making them them think and understand what the consequences are for certain choices. And are we really sure we want that? But it is ultimately it's your choice and giving them a lot of freedom. They thrive on that. Mm-hmm. There's nothing wrong with one method or the other. What's wrong is applying the method to the wrong person. You know, if you are rule and regulation to the kid that does not try <laughs> on that, it's miserable. If you give a bunch of leeway to a kid that's not ready for it, that's not a good idea either. You know? mm. so it's it- actually a conversation I was having with my mom like a few weeks back, like the difference of, you know, like I, <laughs> between my sister and I, and this is kind of what I was saying. I'm like, see, you know, we both have such different personalities. And so I, you can't, you know, it's like the same rules might not be good for both people. And I'm somebody who's naturally always been really independent and like wanted that freedom to explore and think for myself. Whereas 
you know, like naturally my sister is somebody who needs more, like she is a little more dependent and so she needs more structure because, you know, like all of the freedom and stuff like that. So it's just really interesting because we're like night and day and just like the difference of um, how the same parent, because I come from a single parent family, the same parent could have like the same method, but two completely different outcomes. Absolutely. And so <laughs> you have to tweak it, right? You cannot mm-hmm. treat people exactly the same if they are not the same. Yeah. We don't thrive on the same stimuli. You know, you give the same stimuli and you know, it doesn't work that way. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, something I actually, I kind of wanted to come back to, obviously the magical stuff was Joan of Arc. Your series on Joan of Arc was incredible. It was awesome. Um, and what I found really fascinating was that you kind of, at the end, you went through all of the like possible mental health or physical health problems that could have um, been like the reason for her having these visions, like auditory and and visual. Um, Is that like, is that something that you've ever encountered with any other story or is it unique to Joan of Arc's story where you can't debunk it? No, no. I mean, I just did one, like literally the other day that I just released of a crazy story that happened in the 1500s in Strasbourg at the border between Germany and France, where what was known as the dancing plague, which starts with one lady who step out on the street and start dancing and cannot stop. Like she clearly is another state of consciousness and she dances until she passes out and then she gets up and start again and passes out and then start out and it's disconcerting but you know they think okay one crazy lady maybe or who knows what's happening but then 10 other people start doing it and then 20 and then 300 and then 400 and some of them start dying because they dance themselves into a heart attack without able to stop so it's like a compulsion where they cannot physically stop the dance wow what do you make of that you know there are all sort of theory from uh, you know they ate this uh, grain that had this uh, mold on it that give you hallucinatory states but that doesn't really quite hold like argot but, yeah or whatever yeah but mm-hmm. that doesn't really, you know it sounds cool but it doesn't really hold but- then there's like the mass hysteria one which really doesn't explain anything it's like okay that's great but it's not really a full ex- there are all these efforts to explain it that are interesting, but none of them really hold super well. So I tend to resist in those cases, like both in the Joan of Arc story and this one, I tend to resist efforts to, to give it a simple explanation because I don't think they have a simple explanation. I don't find any of the, I mean, I find some explanations more reasonable than others, but I don't find them 100% convincing. There's still something missing there that I'm like, eh, I don't feel that I have it. And so in those cases, I'm okay with not having an answer, with mm. sort of accepting that to me, that's a mystery, that I don't know what happened there. I have no idea. Right. Who, like, um, of all of the different people of history, who is the most interesting character that you've kind of come across? Um, my all-time favorite is probably, I did two episodes on this guy, E.Q. Sojun, a Zen monk from the 1400s in Japan, and he's hilarious. He's <laughs> funny, he, he has a happy life, he just he enjoys his drinks, he enjoys sex tremendously, he's <laughs> a poet, he's just a fun guy, he's just... Uh, and he sat, you know, he clashes with the Zen establishment constantly, but he, he just seemed to have a good time. People around him seemed to have a good time. And he just, I don't know, per, like, you know, so many historical figures, there's something you like, and then there's a big downside, or there's something great, but there's this dark shadow on it. And he is just awesome all around. Like every single thing of research on him is like, yep, yeah, that looks like a great life, a great art. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, he's probably, as far as story, because so many stories that I dig in for History on Fire tend to be really heavy and sometimes disturbing. And there's, a, you know, they may be epic, but there's also a pretty heavy dark side on some of them because history mm-hmm. tends to be fairly dark. Mm-hmm. EQ is nothing like it. It's, uh, in fact, it was a very pleasant break from some of the story because it's just a good, happy story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um- 
So with, um, with some of the characters that you have chose to, to research, um, you, I think you were saying something about, um, just enjoying characters that have this sort of like colorful sort of history and personality. And, um, I think it was uh, the one I was listening to um, about Teddy Roosevelt, you know, yeah. him being like a very extreme, extreme yeah. guy. And yeah, I, I think I'm just kind of curious as to why you tend to feel like more drawn to um, sort of these characters that have the, you know, like cool aspects of their personality, but also like this massive, like <laughs> these other, these other shadowy um, figures to them. I think cause that's kind of how I perceive life, you know, is like, and, and again, this is not a better or worse than other people, but it's an emotional range kind of thing. Right. You know, some people, they gravitate from a plus one to a minus one. Mm -hmm. the highs are there's a very clear limit to it. The lows have a very clear limit to it. And there's nothing, you know, they have the same range. I have somebody who has plus 10, minus 10, you know, in terms of there's the same distance from the zero point in both directions, but there's just more to it. Mm -hmm. And again, more is not better because when you're a minus 10, it's definitely not better than when you're a minus. If you <laughs> all you can go is minus one, I'd rather have that. You know, minus 10 does not feel good. No. But for better or worse, this is where you're at. This is how you're built. This is how you are. And so I... I have an easier time being interested in relating to people who have a really strong hypersensitivity to life, who have powerful emotions, who, as a result, live these epic lives because everything they do is big. Mm -hmm. they, um, and again, I have nothing again. Like if somebody is a pleasant, mellow person and they don't have these crazy high or crazy lows, I don't think that's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, if you find your balance there and you can be happy there, great for you. Sometime I envy that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in my case, it's not even a choice. It's just that's never going to be an option for me. It's not how I'm wired. So this is where we are, <laughs> you know, okay. <laughs> I, I think that's why I relate to it because I'm like, I'm a really passionate person. Like I feel things intensely and it's like that goes, you know, in my favor sometimes and yeah. then... It's also the greatest source of my suffering. Of course. Of course. <laughs> and so it's, uh, and so I'm very interested in people who have that and how they navigate that. Mm -hmm. You know, in most cases, it's, you create some powerful, epic lives, but there's, it's heavy. It's dark. There's a lot of suffering involved. Mm -hmm. um, that's why again the EQ episode makes me happy because it's one of those where he clearly is an extremely intense guy emotionally mm -hmm. but finds his balance some way and then managed to ride through life in a brilliant kind of way so I'm oh. like okay I dig that you know if, uh, if you can take that intensity and passion and not be overwhelmed by it mm -hmm. ooh, then you got something going that's really good yes if you are a very intense person and very passionate learning how to manage and control your emotional state is um it's a tool <laughs> you know, so much otherwise you know the people who are that intense who are you going to be attracted to you're attracted to some other human beings who are fantastic in some ways but mm -hmm. so heavily disturbed that they don't make for a very easy or always pleasant life they make for an intense life which mm -hmm. has its advantages but you know like the caravaggio you know the stereotype of the dark artist who's a genius who creates these masterpieces on everything he touches but he's batshit crazy and he has <laughs> demons that are haunting him all the time and mm -hmm. you know one second he's painting his beautiful amazing thing and the next second he killed the guy in a street duel and then it's like you know it's and in many cases we are told this over and over again that if that's who you are if that's what you want you're gonna pay this monstrously heavy price that your intensity will come at a price of tremendous darkness that will haunt you at every step Hmm. that's an option it's a possibility it's a high possibility mm -hmm. but it's not a sentence you know there are ways to be that intense and find a way to surf through it you know mm -hmm. to find a balance there 
And so anytime I see cases like that, I'm extra happy because, uh, you know, I'm obviously fascinated by the intense human beings, but the intense human beings who manage to find some kind of balance, so much more so because I can learn from it. Mm -hmm. The other one, I already am familiar with the screen. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I enjoy it, but, you know, I don't need, <laughs> I know how that works. Yeah, I know. It's definitely, it's like a lifelong process of trying to figure out, okay, noticing when you're way off one way and knowing when you need to reel, reel yourself in. Yep. Yeah. And just kind of getting to know the different energies that work within your, um, your state, your patterns and everything else, like kind of figuring out um, oh, the ones that are super destructive and yeah, I have to have a spiritual practice and a very, I have to exercise, I have to do things. Otherwise, like, you know, I'm somebody I could sit and my mind, like I'll ruminate and just like, I think a lot of people do, but my mind will just go and go and go and go. And then something as simple as, you know, moving your body or going for a walk or, yeah. you know, sitting down and, uh, you know, just writing all your thoughts on paper can completely move all of that. And you're like, oh my God, <laughs> what was I thinking? Like I was completely delusional <laughs> thinking these things, and not even in reality. Totally. And it's super important for everybody to figure out what their rituals are. You know, what is the stuff that fairly often managed to bring you back to a healthier place? Mm -hmm. Because I mean, it's the same thing that people will look at the bottle of uh, at the bottom of a bottle of booze, right? It's like, you're looking for that same thing that a meditator is looking for. Mm -hmm. um, there are some ways that are healthier than others to get there. You know, there are some rituals that can deliver that to you in a healthier kind of way than others. Mm -hmm. I mean, I see like these days with the whole coronavirus thing, like I know so many people that I know are in martial arts and they can't train and they are going absolutely batshit crazy because that's the thing that keeps them sane, right? That getting on the mat and sweating it out and doing this thing, it's their meditation, right? It's the one that works for them. And, and so have that taken away without having another kind of ritual to replace it that works for them is maddening because that's how they stay, they keep their balance or so things like that is extremely important to figure out for oneself what are the things that work for you and back to what you were saying earlier no two people work the same way mm -hmm. somebody you know oh meditation is amazing somebody else try it and it's like jesus christ it drives me insane i cannot physically do that sit, sit still and it doesn't work for them you know mm -hmm. so it's like it's good to try a bunch figure out which ones are yours well, and there's also so many different types of meditation. There's different types of yoga. There's different types of, um, I mean, depending on, this is again, depending on your emotional state and your energy level. Like if I've just had a cup of coffee and um, all of a sudden I start to feel anxious, the likelihood of me sitting down and focusing yeah. on my breath is like, no, I need a meditation that's going to involve me focusing on something awesome. to <laughs> occupy that energy. So, yeah. Um, I also think that it's important to have more than just, you know, like a couple of, uh, you know, tools. Like people should always be looking to, you know, develop different uh, resources so that you can be self-reliant and have different things that you can, you know, reach for depending on, you know, where it is that you're at in yourself and also just in your life. Because another thing, like if you have maybe a bunch of kids and your home life is really chaotic and busy, again, what you do in your space might need adjustment. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. So um, <laughs> I wanted to actually ask you about um, Jesus in India because, or in the East, because mm -hmm. there is a huge gap in the Bible of like the, you know, that period of time where Jesus was apparently there. And um, there's a lot of similarities um, of what he was teaching and like 
just his gifts and and skills and stuff towards like sadhus and swamis and these mystics in the East. So I'm kind of curious what you know about that. Well, I mean, the whole Jesus thing is tricky because the reality is that there are no sources for anything. And Mm -hmm. I don't, I mean, literally anything like the whole New Testament account could be a hundred percent true or a hundred percent made up and we have zero way to tell because there was not a single line wrote about him when he was alive so start with that there's zero contemporary evidence for his life Hmm. that's kind of starts on a less than solid way in terms of you know hard historical evidence the earliest things you find are written at least a couple of decades later and they are from people who are his followers okay so maybe and then a lot of the other you know most of the new testament is composed later yet uh there's um so in terms of you know solid evidence to go by there isn't any you know it's so uh, and it, again it, this is not unique it's not to pick on that particular story it's true for so many of the stories of the ancient world unless you were sort of the head of the state or something you know julius caesar yeah there's a lot of stuff written by him written about him there's evidence from every direction so okay you know that the guy you know more or less what the story is in a fairly reliable kind of way when you look at people who are not at the center of it all we're not we're all you know at the attention of everybody on Uh, you know how much is mythology and how much is history nobody knows Mm -hmm. same thing i mean if you look at the story of buddha for example nothing is written about him until well over a century after he's dead Uh, how much of that is real I don't know. It's it's always a sketchy proposition. It's kind of like playing telephone for a few decades, where somebody's like, you know, whispering in your ear something that's passed to somebody else, that's passed to somebody else. The odds that whatever is written down vaguely resembled the truth is not that high. Mm. So there's that starting point that makes it tricky to discuss historically in a strict historical sense. It's like there's not a whole lot to go on. As Mm. far as ideas, you know, uh, so that's where it opens up to pretty much every possibility, right? Right. Like the New Testament account is so, it's not a biography of Jesus, you know, it's like Jesus is born a miracle. Actually, it's a miracle in two of the Gospels. Two other Gospels don't even mention the whole birth, virgin birth, all of that stuff. They don't, which you figure is kind of an important piece of the story. Completely skip on it. So <laughs> that, you're like, okay, that's a little odd. But even then, you know, it's like Bert, boom, he's 30 years old. And there's very little in between. There's like one of the Gospels or something is a story of when he's 12 years old or something, you know, very minor stuff. And then that's it. So, of course, uh, you know, the life of Jesus, according to the Gospel, they talk about maybe a year or two of his life. And if uh, assuming that that stuff is true and that he was a real historical figure who lived into his 30s, that means that all you got is two years out of 30 or something. Hmm. So obviously that leaves plenty of room for speculation about assuming that all that stuff is true, what about the rest of the time? What was he doing? Where are his ideas? And again, even in the Gospels themselves, his ideas are not always the same internally like in terms of internal consistency there are stories that go in different direction where you're like hmm this seems to be a bit of a different emph- like some parts of the gospels jesus is clearly sees himself as a jewish messiah for jewish people and screw the rest of the world it's not there for other people it's there for jewish people beginning and then in other lines it's the exact opposite is true it's all about this universal mission for humanity and is not limited to any one nation or anything like that. So you're like, wait, what? And you know, like any of these things, people do bend over backwards to try to reconcile messages that seem to be clashing with one another. But I don't know, when you read them, they do seem to go in pretty different directions, you know? Mm. So it, um, you know, like even if you look at like the Buddha story, assuming that any of that is true, there are a ton of parallels with the Jesus story. 
Mm-hmm. You know, there's a ton of them from the period of uh, isolation, like Jesus 40 days in the desert, Buddha meditating in the forest, you know, fasting, prayer slash meditation, and that's how Buddha become enlightened. And that's where Jesus become Jesus in a sense. It's after that period that he start going around healing and preaching and all of that. During that process of, you know, what would be Buddha's enlightenment and Jesus' own experiences, they both go through this triple temptation. They have, as they are getting kind of close to breaking through the state of consciousness, there are these three things that are put in front of them, tempting them to turn away. Exact same story, right? Mm. Is it because... Why? Who knows? <laughs> you know? Is it because they both were, these are actual historical experience that both these two people had and it's absolutely true? Could be. Could it be that it's a myth that was passed on? Could be. Could it be? It can be a lot of things, you know? The, mm. the reality is nobody knows. <laughs> That's kind of where it is. <laughs> It's true. And That's why when people argue over the real truth and the reality, I'm like, we don't actually really know what, no way first of all, we don't actually know what the truth is because we all have our perception. And like, I was talking about that with another guest um, about like Avidya in um, what I guess Patanjali talks about Avidya and this sort of layer of our conditioned mind that we all kind of go through. And then based on that, that's how we view the world. And so everyone's sense of reality is just completely different as it is. So that's, yeah. Um, I was going to ask you about um, with some of these sort of, you know, because we talk about like Jesus or whatever, you know, he, they say that he rose from the dead. Have you heard much about some of these um, ancient yogis who have like stopped their hearts or like been able to do some of these, you know, have you been able to debunk any of that or find any stories along the way about that kind of stuff? My general approach about stuff is that I don't believe or disbelieve anything. Okay, I have I understand that what I know about how the universe works is extremely limited, and there's a lot outside that range. That doesn't mean that I'm gonna believe something on hearsay. That doesn't mean I'm gonna disbelieve something on hearsay. Mm-hmm. When it becomes part of my experience, cool. I can make a judgment call on it. Until then, it's like cool story that's interesting that's where that's where it ends you know it's like unless you are there and you experience it then it's you know second or third or fourth end story and it, you know, and again i'm i don't dismiss stuff outright just because it doesn't sound uh, plausible according to my experience because again i understand that mine is so limited that there's a lot of stuff that happens for real that's outside of it I've seen and experienced plenty of stuff that does not fit the parameters of how we see of our scientific understanding. Mm -hmm. I understand that there's stuff that does not quite, you know, modern. I'm not a hardcore, like everything that's not explained according to a materialistic model of science must be false. Far from it. Mm -hmm. Um, I know for a fact that that's not the case, that there's something beside that. But of course, that does not mean that I'm going to believe in anything that I haven't experienced myself either. It's kind of like, cool, let's chat up. You know, if you can show me, let's do it. You know, let's try. Let's see if it works. So a lot of these things, the problem with a lot of things that seem to escape the traditional explanations is that, of course, you're going to get a monstrous amount of crap that people make up that is completely fake. Mm-hmm. But occasionally you may run into something that's not that easy to dismiss, and you're like, "Oh, these just because ninety nine other people said the same thing and they were full of it doesn't mean that this one is mm. yeah, I know <clears throat> some things are just unexplainable, and I've had you know quite a few experiences, which is part of the reason why I believe in some of the things I do because I've had you know, experiences where if I were to try to explain it to somebody else, well, you weren't there. So it might sound completely crazy, but, you know, me and one other person were there and we had this experience and we both experienced it. And um, I know uh, in different places, like I've been to India a few times and some of the um, 
like there's these um, sadhus that they're like the standing babas and they never ever like lay down. Apparently they don't sleep. They stand and like just some really crazy stories. Even when you start to look through, um, you know, as I've kind of studied yoga over the years, some stories about these incredible feats, which we would think is impossible. And even when you're reading it, you're like, you know, there's this one story actually, um, Paramahansa Yogananda, I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, but you know, his, um, his guru died and then came back and I'm like, okay, well, if we're talking about him coming back and he's talking, you know, Paramahansa is like, well, how, how can this be? And he's crying and he's upset. And his uh, guru is saying, well, it's the same thing as like my physical body I've manifested. And they talk about quantum packets and particles. And this is in like the early, I think that was in the early 1900s or something like that. And they're talking about all of this. And um, I just find it really fascinating that that is something that used to be more common and now we're kind of in this different time where we don't really believe in anything often. Yeah, and in fact, I tend to, I don't know, I tend to distrust both the, like I'm not comfortable with the degree of certainty that people seem to display on things that they don't have direct experience with, one way mm-hmm. or another, right? It's like the hardcore scientific approach of like, It hasn't been explained in a lab and it hasn't been part of my experience, so it must all be bullshit. What makes you that sure? You know, Mm -hmm. what makes you that confident that you have the absolute explanation for it all? Similarly, I don't, just because I don't stick to that doesn't mean I'm going to believe per se something on hearsay. Again, it's very just like, cool, let's try it out. Let's find out. I'm open to the idea. You know what I mean? It's like, I'm open to the idea. It doesn't mean I believe it, because again, what does it mean? Belief is cheap, right? Belief Mm -hmm. is, uh, what is belief? Belief in that sense is something that you strongly have an opinion on that you have no experience of. That doesn't seem like a good idea. (laughs) You know what I mean? It's like when I do have an experience of, that is not a belief anymore. I can tell you, look, the sun is out. I see it. Uh, The other stuff, I don't know, you know, the other stuff that I don't have direct experience of. Again, I'm a big fan of staying open, you know Mm -hmm. what I mean? Just being very open to the ideas of being, maybe researching, maybe hearing about it. That's very cool. But until it becomes mine, eh, you know. (laughs) (laughs) It's true, because you can can have an open mind to things, but you should also be open to being wrong, (laughs) you know? I feel like, okay, until like when people talk about um, what they believe in and things being true and they are so certain about this being the way and you follow this path and you will make it to my heaven or this heaven or this ebode or whatever. And I'm thinking, unless you have died. Yeah. Which I think, and this is where it gets a little confusing. I'm like, but haven't we all died? If now we're talking about reincarnation, <laughs> it's endless. I don't feel like we have the capacity with our limited human senses to ever understand anything. Yeah. You know, like, I don't think that that's what this world is for. Like, I don't think that we come here to like, be able to have all of this understanding of the universe. It's too big. I think. <laughs> and uh, it, that's what it is. It's like, and, and that's why I find it kind of arrogant when people want to have this uh, hardcore answer that they are 100% sure of. I'm like, how are you 100% sure of anything that is not the stuff in your hands that you do on a daily basis, you know? And and again, it's like, this has been used to reject all the traditional religious dogma, rightfully so, Mm because they were selling you smoke to a large degree, they were selling you this idea that they know the truth when in reality it's like, oh shit, you're making it up as you go. But similarly, I also don't like the scientific arrogance of, uh, hey, if we haven't explained it yet and it hasn't been proven through peer-reviewed studies in a lab, that means it's not real. Like, how the hell do you know what's real and what's not real? I mean, some stuff is more credible than others. Some stuff, there's more evidence than others. But the stuff that we can be sure of, it's not that much. There's Mm -hmm. There's definitely stuff that we can be sure of. It's not that much. 
Yeah. And I think that sometimes, um, not every time, but sometimes when people have this need for um, other people to accept their ideas and theories, I think sometimes it comes from a lack of confidence in what you believe because, you know, it's interesting. And I I can speak on this because I used to be like that um, uh, in my early 20s, actually. And then I went through this, like, you know, dark time of my life. And then it was like, after that, I was like, you know, it doesn't fucking matter what anybody uh, thinks. It doesn't matter if people think that what I believe is true or it isn't true. And I don't need to talk about it because unless it comes up with like the right person and, you know, you can Mm -hmm. yell and talk about it, it doesn't matter because it's how I feel and how I perceive life that makes sense to me. And it was almost like going through this time where it was like I couldn't talk about what I believed in, that I just became, and I even questioned what I believed in, and then kind of came out the other end of it where I was just like, I, it doesn't matter. It's personal to me. Yeah. And even then, it's like, I don't know even stuff that I have experienced. Mm-hmm. I don't know that I, what I believe about it, right? It's like, mm-hmm. let's say I've seen stuff that just does not follow the normal laws of physics as we understand them. Mm-hmm. experience it seen it felt it that's it mm-hmm. what does that mean i don't know <laughs> i have no idea well i'll that's tell you it. yeah okay. I, i'll tell you i'll tell you this one story that you know i've thought of it a couple of times and it's interesting because this is actually one story that i normally wouldn't tell people because it's exactly one of these but i'll, I'll share so um when I first went to India, I was 22 and I was searching for something. I didn't know what it was. And <clears throat> I, and my friends had told me about um, this one place. So there's this holy sort of city called Vrindavan. It's supposed to be like the birthplace of Krishna. And there is this um, temple there. And they say that if you go and you offer the deities, um, uh, Krishna's favorite dessert, which is like rubbery, that he will appear and he will wink. It's like the winking Krishna. Mm-hmm. And I kept asking, like, let's go there, let's go there. I want to see if God exists. And I had this whole sort of, you know, ignorance. <laughs> I want to see if God exists. And then um, it didn't end up happening. Um, we ended up traveling to some other places, and I, ac- I actually had a very uh, as as much as there was some really great experiences, I had a very difficult experience. So let's just say I was humbled by the time I finally came back and returned to Vrindavan about four months later. And I was thinking, okay, if there is a God, he's not going to reveal himself or herself to me. Like maybe this would be to somebody who has dedicated their life to, um, you know, you know, some sort of practice and, I, I, it's not going to happen for me. But anyways, my friend took me to this temple and it was in the old part of the city and you walk up the steps and there's all these lepers and, you know, people that are begging for food and money. And I'm thinking, okay, so I'm kind of also a skeptical, you know, taking a skeptical approach here and I'm looking and I'm thinking, okay, this isn't a touristy sort of trap and i'm right. going past all these people we get inside the temple i had brought this rubbery this dessert with me mm-hmm. and i go into the temple and there's like a hole with a bit of sunlight coming through it's like kind of this old decrepit temple and there's water pouring from the ceiling and there's all these like you know old poor indian people in here and i'm now walk up and i walk up to the pundits and i offer my rubbery And I take a good look at this Krishna painting or not painting deity. And he's got, you know, a painted face and I'm like looking kind of like, okay, if, you know, is there like some sort of like pedal they're going to step on some cheesy, like Mm -hmm. (laughs) some trick or something. And it was just like every other temple that I had been in, in India, just this simple deity painted face. And so I step back and now I'm taking Darshan and I'm standing there with my friend And I start to see this like blinking and I can see these eyes and I kind of like rubbed my eyes. I blinked and I'm thinking, you know, okay, I'm not stoned. (laughs) It's hot, but am I delusional? Like, am I, do I have some kind of heat stroke? And I'm watching for about, you know, two, three, four minutes. I mean, it's hard to even tell like how long I stood there. And this thing was like, 
winking at me and blinking its eyes. And I said to my friend, like, do you see that? He's like, why? I, I, why would I see anything? I didn't offer him rubbery. And to this day, that's one of those moments I look back on in my life. And it's so surreal that I can hardly believe it because it sort of blows my own sense of reality and understanding of like, like I can't explain it. I know I had that experience, but there's still this part of my mind that doesn't want to accept that I did have that experience. Right. Yeah. It's like this sort of d- dissonance that yeah. I'm, you okay. know, yeah. but I can never explain it to this day ever. No, that is, and you know, sometimes, uh, and I'm comfortable with that, with not being able to explain it. Mm-hmm. I had a funny one that, like, I remember once I went uh, to see this lecture by this guy, spiritual teacher, whatever the hell. I don't like the guy. He rubbed me wrong, right? Everything he said just rubbed me wrong. There was an energy to him that rubbed me wrong. I just did not like the guy, right? So I'm not well predisposed to him. And I'm there with a friend. And at one point he says, okay, you know, like, close your eyes. Let's do like a five minute thing where you just let it go, almost like meditation. And I'm like, okay, sure. And at one point I'm like, I'm bored. And I open my eyes and I look at the guy and he's sitting there in meditation and I see his face. And suddenly start changing. And I see like this light around the dude, like visible light to the point that it becomes like his face kind of disappears and it becomes this golden light that fills the room. And I almost can't see anything else. Right? Oh. And then he slowly after a while start going back and I see the guy's face and I'm like, that was weird. And, and I asked later, my friend was with me. He's like, did you see something there? And I'm like, the, the, roots, the roots face disappeared and it was all gold. I'm like, yeah, I saw the same thing. But here is the funny part. Normally, that would lead to go, oh, he's a mystical hero. That means that he's a great enlightened being. And instead, we're like, you still think he's an asshole, though, right? He's like, totally. He's <laughs> so it's just like, yeah, there may be stuff that we can't explain. Mm-hmm. But I think people build on it. Like, oh, since I can't explain this thing that just happened, that means that he is an enlightened being who has the wisdom of the universe and this, that, and the other. And it's like, eh, no, I haven't experienced that. I saw that there's a light that comes out of the dude's face that makes him disappear. <laughs> I, don't I don't need to go beyond that. <laughs> you know? It's like, uh, or, you know, one night I'm sitting in bed and I hear four feet away from me, somebody walking, right? And my girlfriend is there with me and we're like, what the fuck? And we turn on the light and there's absolutely nothing. And there's, you know, we know what the squirrels on the roof sound like. We know it's not like that. It's literally like right next to us, crack, crack, crack on that, like somebody stepping, right? It's no one. And we're like, okay, okay. That was interesting. Now let's go to sleep. He's like, does that mean I know what it was? Do I believe in ghosts? What does that even mean? Do I believe in ghosts or spirits or anything? What exactly are they? I don't know any of that. All I know is that I heard walking in a place where it shouldn't have happened in a way that I wouldn't be that easy to dismiss with some, because that's what you get. You know, the people who are more in the materialistic mindset, they are with desperately cling to some kind of explanation of like, it must have been a noise coming from outside that somehow reverberated in a way that you thought it was. And it's like, no, I kind I of know what I experienced. <laughs> and at the same time, somebody else will run into, oh, that means that the spirits are doing this and that. And it's like, I don't know that either. I heard four steps on my floor. That's it. That's mm-hmm. where it begins and ends, you know? And it's like, and I'm okay with that, with the fact that, uh, you know, once if I get more elements to that story, great, then I will know more. Until then, all I know is what I've experienced. I don't want to run with it any more than that, you know? Yeah. And how many experiences like that, you know, do you, do you have in, like, especially if you have an open mind, you don't have to, you know, spend a lot of time thinking about it, but how many of those experiences have you had? I mean, I've had so many. Yeah. A ton, a ton, a ton. Yeah. A ton. That's why I'm like... Yeah, I understand that the universe is a weird place. Mm -hmm. I understand that there's so much that we can't explain. I'm okay with it. Yeah, yeah. It's it's interesting when you have the experience with another person as well. Sure. Yeah, there was definitely like, I think... a couple years ago now, my partner and I, we had this experience and like we tried to explain it to other people and they were just like, 
oh, well, you know, what if it was this? And what if it was that? And we're both just like, nope, we for sure both saw the exact same thing. And, um, yeah, it was, it was, we were like actually sitting, um, so funny because before I even go to explain some of this stuff, like there's that part of you where you're like, oh, people are going to think I'm crazy, but, but you know, you had the experience and yeah. you know, but you know, we, we were sitting and, um, we saw this thing emerge from the dark. We were in the middle of nowhere. Like there's lots of areas out here where we live in the Valley where there's nobody around, lots of farmland. And I'm not joking. We saw, um, it was like, we were facing this dark part of the forest and it's like the old rock quarry and basically everywhere around you are just fields and no street lights, no light. Um, it's on an old logging road. And why were we sitting there? Well, cause we're weirdos and you know, we're just having conversations sitting there. And, uh, then all of a sudden we saw this, like, it was almost like two fiery hot coals had been picked up out of a fire, but there was no fire. Mm-hmm. like burning like embers and just all of a sudden one here and then there. And we were both just like, we couldn't stop looking at it because it was in the middle of the darkness, these two red coals just all of a sudden right there. And we're like looking and we're like, do you see that? Yeah, I see that. Like, what is that? Anyways, it both freaked us out. So we ended up quickly running, uh, getting in the car and ripping down the road. And we kind of stopped and we're like, what was that? Like, and to this day, we don't really know. There's theories um, from different people sure. about what we saw and what we experienced. But to this day, it's like what we saw, like it definitely wasn't like the glow of an animal's eyes and they were too big for it to even be like a bear's eyes. So yeah, there's, there's some strange things that have made me a believer in the mysteries of the universe. <laughs> That's the only guarantee is that the universe is a mysterious place and there's a lot more than we can understand. That's pretty much the only safe bet. Yeah, definitely. Well, um, I, I know that you have to get going here because we're just about at an hour and a half. Um, so I want to say thank you so much for coming on. I feel like now we've gotten to the end. We're talking ghost stories and I'm thinking, <laughs> I should have you come back. We can talk about ghost stories and skinwalkers and all of that. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show and Oops. sharing sharing your wisdom. Thank you so much for chatting. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay, well, you have a wonderful day. <laughs> Bye, Danielle. Bye. Have a great one. Well, that concludes another episode of the Shanti Ma podcast. Before I let you go, I would like to take a moment to thank Eli Ramley for his donation to our friends over at Love Broj, and another big thank you to Brittany Anderson for her donation as well. Love Broj is an organization that is completely nonprofit. They're doing things like picking up garbage, feeding the cows, distributing emergency food during COVID-19, as well as many other rehabilitative type projects in lovely, beautiful, sacred Vrindavan. If you'd like to learn more or donate to the cause, you can head on over to Instagram at love, B-R-A-J, and check out what they're doing and get involved. I hope you are all having a very lovely day, evening, Wherever you are, we're finally into springtime and it feels amazing to ah, welcome the sweet, sweet sunshine and say goodbye to all the dark, cloudy, rainy days that we experience here in Vancouver. Thanks so much for tuning in, guys. It really means a lot. Until next time. Dahi mahi, diyo yoma, machodaya. Om pur, uva svaha, hatsavitur varinyam. Va
Timor Podcast.